this is livingpianos.com and I'm Robert Estrin. Today I'm going to talk about what I learned watching my father practice the piano. Boy, it brings back such memories. We grew up in a house in the suburbs of Long Island, about an hour from Manhattan, and we had a kind of a big house. My, my father, when we first moved into that house when I was five years old, it was a very exciting time, and my father had a studio built. We already had this double ranch, pretty big house to begin with, but this studio was enormous. I mean, uh, the, the record there was a recital with 80 people. Now, some of them were spilling over into the patio, and it was crowded, but <laughs> we had a lot of concerts there and a lot of fun. And the cool thing was, although my father taught music at Hofstra University, he did most of his teaching right in the studio in the back of our house where he had two grand pianos, and uh, we, we had a lot of good times there. Well, in, you know, in the summer in particular, and you know, whenever my father had any time free from teaching, because he did an immense amount of teaching, um, he'd be practicing the piano. And I would oftentimes just stroll down there and just sit and listen to him, and I always found it interesting. But I'm gonna share with you an extremely personal story uh, about what I learned watching him practice. And this was really an epiphany. Um, well, I'm going to share something that, that was kind of a, a sad uh, mishap uh, that uh, I've never shared with anybody really. But my father had a, an illustrious uh, recording career as well as concertizing. And he started making records in the 1950s. His first recording was the complete Chopin Ballades and the F minor Fantasy for Fantasy Records by coincidence. And then he did some recordings of the music of Meyer Kupferman, pieces that were written for him, some extremely difficult 12-tone pieces that he played all from memory, by the way. Unbelievable. Um, but then he started making a series of recordings for Connoisseur Society Records. And Alan Silver, who was the producer and the owner of the company, was truly an artist. And what he was able to achieve uh, both sonically and musically in his recordings with so many artists was truly astounding. And uh, these recordings, um, I love them to this day. And my father, his first one for Connoisseur Society was the Scriabin Opus 8 Etudes, which uh, won for Record of the Year. It was the first uh, LP of these these magnificent works and uh, wonderful performances. Then he recorded the Rachmaninoff Opus 32 Etudes, I mean Preludes, pardon me, which, by the way, he performed on several occasions, including in Lincoln Center, the complete Rachmaninoff Preludes, which, by the way, is a mind-boggling task. Um, anyway, after that, there was uh, a time when he was preparing a list record. And uh, I remember attending the sessions, and somehow things just didn't gel. And even though everything was set up, and the piano was chosen, and the technician was there, and everything was set up, they had to abandon the session. And I'm revealing something very, it was a really tenuous moment there, you know. But that's what happened. So some time went by. And then the next recording my father decided to do, along with uh, Connoisseur Society Records, was a Brahms album. But he also, they had this plan for a series of albums entitled Great Hits You Played When You Were Young, which sounded kind of corny, but these ended up being so popular because the performances were so magnificent, the recording quality was exquisite, that radio stations just loved these, and they played all these famous piano pieces everywhere in the world. They were just a staple. Anytime I turned on the radio, no matter where I was, if I was visiting my sister in Cleveland or right in New York, or, and the reviews came in all over the world, they were played constantly every time you turned the radio on. But anyway, in preparation for those sessions, he worked so hard uh, that he ended up recording three records in one series of sessions, I think just a few days. Um, you know, they thought it was going to be the Brahms and maybe one of these discs. He ended up just had so much repertoire and such a high level, they just he just slammed through um, three complete albums in the one session. Well, 
what I'm going to reveal to you is what I learned from listening to his preparation for, the, for those recording sessions, particularly the Brahms. I remember listening to him practice, and he got to a point where he would just be going through everything with no pedal, just a little bit under tempo, just absolutely, um, you know, like falling off a log. Every, every single finger just fell in place. And it was exciting for me to, to hear him play like that because there was such unbelievable refinement in his playing and security. He prepared so unbelievably for those sessions. It was astounding. There were so many of those that were just one take on that, uh, you know, oftentimes the first take, he was that well prepared and just went through all of this music. And by the way, you must listen. I'll have links below uh, for these these discs. Uh, some of them I've, I've put on YouTube. Some of them other people have put on YouTube. And you got to check them out. But that is the lesson for today is you want to get to the point where you have ultimate security. And, and eventually it had it basically up to tempo, no pedal, just everything, just playing with total ease and total accuracy that I knew from listening to and practice that way. My gosh, this is going to be great. Complete preparation, you know, because most classical recordings have a lot of editing because it saves time. You know, if you have a, a work that's 20 minutes long, you know, to get one perfect performance. And, you know, on recordings, if just a little crack note that you might not notice in a live performance, it's really annoying when you listen over and over again. But, man, he was so well prepared on this. And, it's, by the way, it's, it's still beautiful, beautiful playing that you should check out. So that's my personal story for today. I revealed some weakness of my monumentally great <laughs> pianist father, Morton Estrin. And uh, I hope you've enjoyed this. Again, I'm Robert Estrin. This is livingpianos.com. Thank you for subscribing. Ring the bell, the thumbs up, all that good stuff so I can keep bringing these videos to you. See you next time. Bye-bye.